This is lecture week three, uh, part two. Uh, we're discussing uh, the earned income tax credit. We just got done talking about uh, the economic context, uh, talking about fiscal policy, uh, and really the relevance of fiscal and monetary policy and how we uh, stabilize or uh, uh, stimulate the economy. Uh, this is looking at the tax treatment of low-income individuals and how taxes affect low-income individuals. And we look at a very first program here, the earned income tax credit. I do want to give you a heads up and let you know that this, uh, this is a highly technical uh, part of the lecture. Uh, and so uh, it's imperative that you uh, have the slides in front of you. Um, uh, there's, there's some calculations involved. Uh, there's, uh, I'm not going to require uh, anything more than what we need to understand a program. And so I hope that you guys uh, can trust me to, uh, uh, to take you through this. Uh, and uh, the calculations are not just for calculation's sake, but to understand really uh, how the earned income tax credit works. Uh, and so uh, please uh, follow along uh, closely uh, with the slides uh, as we move forward. Uh, that's just a little bit of a note. Uh, all right, so the tax treatment of low-income uh, families and how taxes uh, may affect low-income families. I offer uh, numerous uh, justifications for why uh, taxes are important to learn. Uh, uh, as they affect uh, the populations with which we work. Uh, so uh, certainly in terms of the revenues that we raise uh, in the way of fiscal policy, those uh, revenues uh, can be used for programs that assist low-income populations. There's a direct effect on low-income populations. Uh, there might be some effect on behavior in terms of the types of taxes we alluded in the last lecture to sales taxes. Uh, there could be uh, cigarette taxes, uh, alcohol taxes, gasoline taxes, highly regressive taxes that uh, have a disproportionate effect on low-income populations. That's another uh, justification that I offer. Uh, the setting of the tax threshold, the type of tax, uh, whether it's progressive, regressive, or proportional, uh, these things matter uh, to low-income individuals. Uh, so I think there's uh, numerous justifications uh, for why tax uh, policy is important to low-income populations. Uh, not just the tax itself, but in terms of the credits that may apply. The tax credits, whether it's refundable, non-refundable, uh, can also have an impact on low-income low families. So we look at uh, tax policy and specifically the earned income tax credit. But first, uh, just uh, I want to speak just generally about uh, tax policy, about federal tax policy. Our federal income tax structure, uh, if you're doing a basic step-by-step uh, -step, uh, process of how, how we would go about uh, filing our taxes, uh, we start out uh, with your gross income. Uh, in terms of your tax filings, you have your gross income. Uh, you have uh, basic concepts. You have your exemptions and your deductions. Uh, exemptions are basic reductions in your income, uh, and they're based on the number of people in the filing unit. So it depends on how many people uh, are in the unit uh, for which you're filing, right? So how many people in the family unit often. Uh, the 2011 exemption level, uh, as noted in your slides, is 3750, 3750. And so if there are two people in your family, if in your filing unit, uh, your basic reduction, your exemption level is going to be 7,500. If there are three people, you would multiply 3,750 by three uh, to reduce uh, your income uh, for uh, tax calculation purposes. Uh, that's exemptions. Uh, and then you have your deductions. Uh, you can have standard deductions. You can have calculated deductions. Uh, these are further reductions uh, in your income for tax calculation purposes. Uh, the tax uh, the standard uh, deduction uh, depends uh, not on the number of people in the filing unit, uh, but on the type of uh, filing unit. Uh, so whether you're filing as a single individual, uh, a head of household, a married uh, couple, uh, the standard deduction amounts will differ depending on the type of uh, uh, type of filing unit. So if you're filing as a, a, as a single individual, uh, the standard deduction amount is going to be 5,800. If you're filing as a married couple, uh, the, the standard deduction is $11,600. Uh, and so uh, that's, of course, one of the benefits to being married is that you have a much greater uh, standard deduction. Uh, these are further reductions, once again, uh, in your income that gets, uh, that gets calculated, uh, that, gets in, uh, that gets taken into account for tax calculation purposes. Not only do you have uh, your standard deductions, but you have calculated deductions as well. These are your itemized uh, deductions. Uh, when you hear people talk about their tax write-offs, for example, uh, uh, this is what they're talking about. You have further reductions based on uh, some of your expenses. So moving expenses uh, can be uh, uh, a form of a, a, a calculated deduction. 
Uh, medical costs, certain medical costs that exceed certain amounts uh, can be uh, further calculated deductions. Uh, if you make charitable contributions, if you're uh, donating money uh, to a nonprofit entity or a church, for example, you may uh, reduce your, uh, your uh, gross income uh, by a further amount. Uh, and so we have, uh, in short, we have our exemptions and deductions uh, that reduce uh, our, uh, our tax, taxable income. Uh, so once you've adjusted your gross income uh, with exemptions and your deductions, your standard and calculated deductions, you can figure the amount of uh, money that you owe in taxes, and that's uh, what we mean by your tax liability. Uh, and so uh, once you figure your tax liability, there are certain tax credits that apply, uh, and that's what the earned income tax credit is. It's a tax uh, credit. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a program that applies a credit uh, to your tax liability. Uh, and so your tax credits, uh, generally speaking, can be either refundable or non-refundable. And this should be intuitive. Uh, of course, uh, refundable credits are much more favorable uh, to low-income populations uh, than non-refundable credits uh, because uh, this is something that you get back as in the form of a check, right? Uh, that should be pretty uh, fairly uh, straightforward. Also, uh, something not so straightforward is the fact that low-income populations uh, typically have very little uh, to no tax liability. Uh, and so if you have a non-refundable tax credit and you don't owe anything in the way of taxes, the tax credit uh, really just goes for naught. Uh, but if you have that refundable tax credit in place, like the EITC, you can get back a check from the government. Uh, and so uh, the bottom line here in terms of the concepts, your exemptions and your deductions will reduce your taxable income. Uh, and then you have your tax credits, uh, which reduce your tax liability. They get applied to your tax liability uh, or the amount of uh, money you owe in taxes. I show in your slides uh, the U.S. Uh, income tax rates or the tax brackets, in other words. Uh, these are marginal tax rates, meaning it's the tax uh, rate or the percentage that's applied on the next dollar of, of earnings. Uh, and so you see the lowest tax bracket is at 10%. Uh, and for single individuals, I'm looking at the single individual column. So for single individuals who have uh, adjusted uh, gross income up to uh, $8,500, uh, the, uh, the marginal tax rate will be 10%. Uh, and so uh, in terms of adjusted gross income from 8501, uh, so that that dollar that exceeds uh, 8501, you pay a 15% tax on dollar 8502 of, of uh, adjusted gross income, you pay 15% all the way up to uh, $34,500, that next bend point, uh, at, which, at which point uh, you're going to start paying uh, a 25% tax on dollar 34501. Uh, on dollar thirty-four thousand five hundred two, you pay uh, twenty-five uh, percent. Uh, so these are marginal tax rates. Uh, they differ uh, depending on uh, the level of uh, level of income. And you see that the uh, uh, you see the bend points are different for married couples filing jointly. I give you an example of a tax liability calculation. I'm not going to ask for this uh, on any sort of exam, but this is just to see uh, how your tax uh, amounts uh, actually get calculated. So the example here is of a single taxpayer. You have a single individual with no kids. Uh, this person has income, adjusted gross income. Uh, so this is after applying exemptions and deductions. This person has $50,000 of income. Uh, and so uh, 8500 the first $8,500 of this person's income will be taxed at 10%. Uh, and so this person owes 850 in the way of taxes uh, to start off. Uh, from $8,501 all the way up to $34,500, uh, this person will be taxed at 15%. Uh, and so that's uh, that's twenty six thousand dollars of earnings that's going to be taxed at fifteen percent, uh, which amounts to thirty nine hundred dollars, and then uh, uh, the amounts exceeding thirty four thousand five hundred dollars, which comes out to uh, fifteen thousand five hundred for this individual with fifty thousand dollars of adjusted gross income, uh, is going to be taxed at twenty five percent, and so you see the amount there in your slide that's going to be three thousand eight hundred seventy five. Uh, and so the total tax, uh, the total tax before any sort of credits are applied, uh, is going to be eight thousand six hundred twenty-five dollars. Uh, note the di uh, the di uh, distinction between actual and marginal tax rates. So eight thousand six hundred twenty-five dollars, uh, that amount calculated as a percentage of this person's adjusted gross income of fifty thousand dollars, actually comes out to seventeen point two five percent. So the actual tax, uh, the actual tax rate paid by this person is seventeen point two five percent. But we distinguish that from the marginal tax rate, or the tax bracket uh, which this person is in. Uh, this person was in the 25% tax bracket. Uh, recall that this person had adjusted gross income of $50,000, which is in that 25% range. So there's a distinction here. That's the point, uh, distinction between the actual tax rates 
uh, and the marginal tax rates. Uh, I give you exercise two in your slides. If you want to uh, go through it, I'll give you the answers. But uh, this is calculating tax liability and the actual and the marginal tax rates. But uh, we have a more realistic example uh, for our purposes. You have a single uh, mo uh, mother uh, with two kids, uh, and she makes $25,000 a year. Uh, and so the first thing I ask for is, uh, what's her tax liability? Uh, and so you need to adjust that amount. Uh, I should uh, specify here, this is gross income. Uh, and so we need to apply her exemptions and her deductions. Uh, this person's filing unit, uh, there are three people in this, uh, in this filing unit. And so this person is entitled to three exemptions. And so if you recall the standard exempt, uh, the exemption amount, the exemption amount for 2011 was 3750 multiplied by three. Uh, we've calculated this to be 11250 uh, and so that $25,000 initially, that gross income, will be reduced by 11250 which yields 13750 uh, And that gets further reduced by her the amount of the standard deduction. Uh, and so assuming that she files as head of household as opposed to a single individual, uh, which would make more sense for her because uh, she uh, she will get a, a larger standard deduction. And so if you reduce her taxable income at that moment, which is 13750 by an additional 8500 which is the amount of the standard deduction for someone filing as head of household, uh, she'll be left with uh, $5,250 of taxable income. So in response to the first question there in exercise two of, does she have any tax liability? Yes, she does. Uh, she has uh, $5,250 of tax taxable income. Uh, and so her tax liability is simply 10% uh, of that amount, or $525. That's her tax liability. Uh, what's the actual tax rate? Her actual tax rate is 10%, right? 525 is the amount that she's paying in taxes. Uh, the marginal tax rate, the tax bracket she's in, is also 10%. And so the actual and ta uh, marginal tax rate for this low-income person is the same, at 10%. That's, uh, those are the answers uh, to exercise two in your slides. Uh, we move to... Uh, uh, the program uh, that we have uh, in mind here, that's the Earned Income Tax Credit, uh, often thought of as a negative uh, income tax uh, in the fact that it's a refundable tax credit, right? Uh, this was a program that was enacted in 1975 uh, after lots of experimentation that was done at the state level uh, with these negative income tax experiments, uh, the most famous uh, being the New Jersey uh, negative income tax experiment. You can read uh, up on that if you'd like. You can simply Google that, and, and uh, there's a lot of research on that uh, particular experiment. Uh, but uh, a couple other points here. Uh, we started indexing, uh, so adjusting uh, some of the, uh, the bend points uh, and the mounts uh, in 1987. Uh, there, was, there were significant expansions in 1993 uh, when President Clinton took, off, took office. He really, uh, he really uh, t uh, made an effort uh, to build this program up. Uh, but the gist of it is this. Uh, this is an earned income uh, credit, so you must have earned income. You must have worked. Uh, in the previous uh, uh, tax uh, year uh, to qualify for credits. Uh, and the credit is fully refundable, like we said, uh, like we alluded to before. Uh, the, the, the credit uh, is going to benefit low-income populations much more. It's going to be much more favorable to low-income populations because it is, it is in fact, uh, fully refundable. Uh, you can think of this tax uh, credit. Uh, I think the best way to think about it is, in terms of this visual, uh, that you see up here, uh, that, uh, that's over my shoulder. Uh, on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis, is the level of income. So we uh, move from zero on the left uh, to higher levels of income uh, as we move to the right. Uh, and then as we move vertically from zero, over the bottom point, uh, up uh, higher, that's the amount of the credit. Uh, and so uh, this program is thought of in three phases. Uh, there's a phase-in stage, uh, or a phase-in aspect. There's a plateau aspect. There's a phase-out aspect, and you have these different graphs uh, depending on the number of kids uh, in the filing unit. So you're going to have different amounts, uh, different tax credit amounts uh, that apply uh, for families of different sizes. Uh, and so I've put up here just uh, the graph for a single individuals with no kids. Uh, you have the phase-in stage, so you have a 7.65% credit uh, that applies for each dollar that you make. So for each dollar that you earn, uh, the government is giving you a credit of 7.65 cents uh, on, on, on that dollar. So this is not a coincidental amount. That 7.65% uh, is just enough to offset uh, your Social Security tax. So we pay 7.65% in the way of our Social Security and Medicare taxes combined. Uh, and so there's, like I said, there's some meaning uh, to that. 
Uh, you get 7.65% uh, on each dollar that you earn, all the way up to this first uh, bend point. Uh, and so all the way up to $6,065 uh, in the way of uh, your gross income. Uh, you see that bend point uh, up to $464. That's the plateau. Uh, that's the maximum credit amount. So anything that you earn between $6,065 and $7,500, you're going to get a credit of $464 from the government. But if you make too much, uh, there's a penalty. Now, so if you start exceeding $7,500, you can see that there's a clawback. The government will claw back 7.65% of that maximum benefit amount of 464 uh, And then there's the phase out. That's the general structure of the program. There's a similar structure for uh, families with one kid. Uh, of course, the maximum, the plateau amount is going to be much greater. There's a phase in at 34% a maximum of $3,094 and a phase out of uh, a clawback of 16% for families with one kid uh, and uh, much greater amounts for families with two kids. Families with three kids, uh, the grant goes up to $5,751. So uh, certainly not an insignificant amount. Uh, I give you an example uh, in your slides. You have a single parent, two kids, uh, once again, uh, and this person makes $19,000, uh, I say in your slides. Uh, this is gross income of $19,000. So uh, if you apply the exemptions, if you apply the deductions, this person has no income tax liability. And you should, uh, at this point, you should know why. This person is, excuse me, this person is entitled to three exemptions. So that's uh, that's the $3,750 amount multiplied by three. Now that's the reduction that this person is entitled to. And then to this person, assuming that this person is filing as head of household, uh, you have a further reduction of 8,500, so that uh, that brings that taxable income uh, to zero. So there's no tax liability. Uh, so at this point, uh, you have to go to the appropriate schedule. Uh, and so with two kids, uh, you notice that for two kids, the maximum uh, credit, the EITC amount, is going to be $5,112. Uh, and so we're trying to figure how much uh, this person is owed in the way of a credit. It's $5,112. And you want to see if this person uh, should pay anything in the way of a, a clawback. Is there a clawback? And so to assess if there's a clawback, you have to see where the last uh, bend point is. Uh, the last bend point is at 16450 So if you make anything more than 16450 in gross income, there will be a clawback. And so this person will pay uh, a clawback uh, because this person has earned $19,000. The clawback amount uh, is going to be the difference. Uh, this is noted in your slide. It's the difference between the gross earnings of $19,000 minus the bend point of $16,450. That's $25,50. This person will pay a clawback of 21% on that amount, and I give you that uh, amount. Uh, and so uh, if you're uh, calculating the total uh, credit for this person, it's the maximum credit of $5,112 minus the clawback of $535.50. And this person's uh, EIC uh, benefit amount is $4,576.50, a not so insignificant amount. If you calculate that as a percentage of this person's gross income, it's approximately 24% of earnings. That's a, that's a huge, uh, it's a huge uh, benefit uh, to low-income families. I give you another example uh, to help you through this. I give you example uh, exercise three. You can work through this yourself, but uh, in short, I'll give you the, the answers here. But the amount of exemptions, because you have a single parent with one child, this person is only entitled to two exemptions. Right? There, there are two people in the filing unit. Uh, and so it's that 3750 multiplied by two. And so the uh, exemption amount is 7500 So the amount of exemptions over my uh, right shoulder, that's what I point out here. Uh, the amount of exemptions is going to be 3750 I don't know if you can see that well, but it's 3750 multiplied by two equals uh, $7,500. That's the amount of exemptions. If you're figuring the amount of deductions, assuming, I said in the slide, that assume that this person is filing as, as a, a head of household, uh, uh, that amount is simply $8,500. Uh, and so uh, the next part is, is there any tax liability? Well, if you've reduced $15,000 by $7,500 and then further reduced by $8,500, this person has no taxable income and therefore has no uh, tax liability or no, uh, th this person doesn't owe anything in the way of taxes. And so there's no tax liability. And so if you want to figure uh, the amount of refundable uh, earned income tax credit for this person, uh, you would go to the appropriate uh, EITC schedule, uh, in which case you'll notice that the maximum uh, credit amount for uh, a single person with one child is going to be $3,094. Uh, 
Uh, and so the last issue we need to uh, address is, is there a clawback? Well, uh, there's only a clawback if the gross income exceeds uh, that last bend point. And so uh, the bend point for a single individual with one kid is uh, at $16,450. Uh, $15,000 does not exceed $16,450. Uh, and so the, the clawback does not kick in. In other, in other words, if this bend point were at $16,450, uh, anything exceeding that amount, uh, you would see a clawback. This person is within uh, within that amount, fifteen thousand dollars. So there, there is no clawback for this individual. Uh, and so uh, the basic point here is, if you have a client who comes in, uh, you're working at a social service agency, and you have a client co who comes in, and this person is asking you about this uh, large program, this yeah, this large, the largest anti-poverty program that we have out there. And they're asking you, uh, can you give me an estimate of how much I may get, get back from the government in the way of an EITC benefit? Uh, you should be able to at least give a ballpark figure is what I'm hoping here with, uh, with this understanding of EITC and how it works. Uh, we, I just noted that this is the largest anti-poverty program that we have. Uh, one other issue that I want to note here is that uh, we have another moral hazard that comes up. Uh, with the, the rapid expansion of this program, uh, many people are trying to take advantage of this program, but uh, there are other requirements. Uh, there are other requirements, uh, legal requirements, uh, namely, uh, you saw the difference uh, in the maximum credit amount between a single individual uh, who may get back $464 versus uh, a single individual with one kid even uh, who gets back over $3,000. And so there's a tendency to, uh, uh, to try to make it seem like uh, there's a kid living with you for more than uh, six months out of the year, which is the legal, legal requirement. Uh, and so once again, we're dealt with uh, another moral hazard issue, much like we have with some other public assistance programs. But you have custodial parents, you have non-custodial parents. You have a non-custodial parent who's, who's working, uh, but the kid's not always with them. But uh, the tendency is for them to, to make it seem like in the paperwork that the kid is living with them for more than six months. That's the issue that's arising. You see another moral hazard issue. Uh, and that's just something to take note of. Um, uh, I have some outdated numbers uh, in your slides, but uh, the point is that this is a rather large program now. Uh, we have more than 20 million families receiving EITC benefits as of 2005, uh, and benefits exceeding uh, on an aggregate level. We have $40.6 billion being spent on EITC benefits. Uh, so uh, a tremendous program uh, with lots and lots of growth potential. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll stop there uh, with this slide, uh, and uh, I'll encourage you guys uh, to come to the review session the optional review session and we can go over some more examples uh, there.